it's that time of the year again, the glitz, the glamour, and the awkward political issues regarding the Academy Awards on today's episode of That Song From That Movie. Crystal. Clear. Correct. Ooh. Thank you for joining that song from that movie, the journey through the very best and worst of movie songs. I am your Twisted Fire Saga host, Dietrich, and today we're joined by Leslie Odom Jr.'s number one fan, Alex. Not a lie. No joke. And we're also joined by Diane Warren's number one fan, Ooh. Ben. Yeah, I mean, collectively, we are the number one fan club for Diane Warren. I, want, I do wonder about that. This could be a year. <laughs> Fan of the podcast, Diane Warren. <laughs> yeah, come on. You've got to say that. I'm looking forward to the jingle. Oh, crap, I'm not ready. <laughs> <laughs> Do it in post. Do it in both. <laughs> so what have we been watching this week? I have been trying to watch the Oscar films in preparation for this podcast and not the actual Oscars. By Oscar films, do you mean the Best Picture nominees or do you mean the, the ones for Best Original Song? Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, mostly the best picture nominees, because some of them, at the time of recording, are still not out in the UK, which is a pain in the tush. Um, but yeah, I watched Nomadland, which I really enjoyed, uh, and Minari, which was also very good. So I'm working my way through. Promising Young Woman, future Ben will have seen that. Yes, yes, that's one that I think I might be able to watch before the Oscars. <laughs> yes, because it comes out on Now TV tomorrow. It does, yes. Is it tomorrow? Or 18th, maybe. I think it's tomorrow. A day in the past. Yeah, or last or last week. <laughs> yeah, or last week. Last week. Enjoy that, future Ben. Thanks, past Ben. Future Ben here. It was a very interesting film. Didn't know if I should be taking it one hundred percent seriously or laughing at parts, but I was uncomfortable throughout. Future Alex will enjoy. Or past Alex. I'm confused. Do you watch anything? Have I have I watched anything? Um no films. <laughs> Yeah, I think I've watched some TV though. Started watching a documentary, true crime documentary, classic. Unlike you. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. Uh, called The Wilderness of Error, which is based on an Errol uh, Morris book. I don't know if you guys know Errol Morris. He did um, Thin Blue Line. Yes. It's like the... a really famous true crime documentary from like the 80s. It's like one of the originals. It's the first one to use the sort of like sat on a chair, isn't it, speaking to camera? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's it's, it's like it's, it's considered a classic anyway, and it is good. And it, he wrote this book, and then this documentary is based on his book. It's quite interesting, but I won't bore you all with the details. <laughs> it's quite interesting, <laughs> but I won't bore you. <laughs> <laughs> I find it interesting. Well, the only film I've watched this week is one of the ones we're talking about today. So hang fire on that one. Ooh. <laughs> I can probably guess what it is. <laughs> and you'll and you'll probably be right, Ben. Uh, but I thought I'd talk about the return of Snack Masters, the best reality cooking show on TV. Snack Masters? What's the, con- what's the concept? So the concept is you, they get two like Michelin star chefs and they give them something like, for example, this week, a wagon wheel, or last <laughs> week it was a KFC Zinger burger, and they have to recreate it. <laughs> it's fantastic TV. I al- There's always a <laughs> chef who thinks he's too good and makes it better, and then therefore they lose because it's less like the actual burger. What? or the actual chocolate or the actual crisp or whatever it is that week. So you said this week was a wagon wheel? Yeah. Was it a jam wagon wheel or was it the original? No, I also prefer a jam wagon wheel. Yeah. I can see where you're going with this. And yeah. the jam wagon wheel is superior, but it, it was a standard wagon wheel. Mm, that's too, yeah, it's a bit plain for me. I need You need the jam infusion. <laughs> you, you do? You do? <laughs> My God, you too. <laughs> okay, so today's episode is a, a special episode. It's This is part one of our run through of the 2021 Best Original Song Academy Award nominees. I'm going to hand over the reins of the podcast to Ben, for he is now your host. Yeah, here we go. No pressure. Yeah, so obviously being this amalgam movie music podcast, we thought we would throw in our uneducated, poorly researched, and highly irrelevant opinions on the nominees for the Best Original Song Oscar. And yes, I'm speaking for all three of us before you get tetchy. Hopefully one of them will go down in the history books alongside such Hollywood staples as It's Hard Out Here for a Pimp. Uh, and Man or Muppet, you know, classic Hollywood, Hollywood that is a good songs. song. Both of them are great songs. But yeah, before we get into that, let's have a look, quick look at the other categories that are on show for this year, because it has been a very weird year for many reasons. One of which is 
movies. I think in the past 12 months, I have been to the cinema three times. Whereas when I looked at my uh, subscription card from the year before, in the last, the year before that, I went 60 times. I have been once in the past year. Tenant. Alex, when was the last time you went to the cinema? Oh, God, may I ask you a question? When did, uh, when did Knives Out come <laughs> when did out? The Hind- when did the Hindenburg go down? <laughs> oh, no, actually, I went, the last film I went to would have been very good. I actually went to see Parasite, which I think must have been just before the pandemic started. Yeah, I, th- I saw it in January, so it can't have been long after that. Yeah, I saw it in December. I saw it later. I saw it later. I think it was like, yeah, I think it was like mid-Feb. I think that was like, I saw Knives Out. At one of those uh, baby screenings, <laughs> <laughs> which was an interesting experience, and then I uh, yeah I also saw Parasite, but but not in the baby screen. So over a year ago, and I mean three staples have had to grind to a halt this year. It seems to have paved the way for what might be the most sort of unique, probably diverse award season ever, with mostly like indie cinema. I guess some things picked up by Netflix and Amazon, but it is small budget cinema. And that's all we have right now. And so it's what we have to choose from. <laughs> so you could say that these films are the leftovers, the ones that have actually managed to scrape their way through the COVID cracks in order to be nominated. Or you could say that this is actually quite a welcome change, that this is the most diverse Oscars we've had in a long time. It's a welcome difference to actually have new names, new faces being nominated, different directors. One thing's for sure, it's been hard to watch a lot of the films due to differing release dates, the closing of cinemas, and a lot of the films are still not available in the UK. But I'm just curious what you guys think of this year's 2021's Oscars. Um, in what regard? In terms of, like, what do I think, like, why do I think these films have been nominated? Or... Well, do you think it's a, do you, like I said, do you think it is just, oh, it's, these are just the dregs? Or do you think, actually, it's quite nice having a bit of a change of pace with just small budget films? I think that's nice. And I think that's actually what a lot of people have been crying out for. I think the difficulty is, is that I haven't really been able to watch any of them. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think I've seen one of the Best Picture nominees. I probably would have seen two if I do manage to see Promising Young Woman by next week. Whereas I think usually I would even like just by accident see four. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, because I feel like around this time of year or maybe in the couple of months preceding, it's just very easy to find these pit- these films around the since because usually they've been released. Maybe some, they've, some of them have had small releases, but then they decide, oh, well, you know, it's a war season. Let's put them all on, on sort of like, then they make it to like the showcases of this world or the audience and whatnot. So I always manage to see a few. So I, I feel like I'm more informed usually, whereas this year I, I have no idea like <laughs> about any really of the films that are nominated. So it's difficult to say. But I, I would say like as a general principle, it's nice that smaller budget films are sort of making the cut this year. But I do wonder whether that is just simply because, <laughs> like you say, the higher budget films are not there. Yeah, when I look at the Best Picture nominees for this year, in previous years, I would have already heard of most of them before they were nominated. Yeah. Like, before they announced the nominees, but this year it was me going, The the Father? What's that? Never heard of it. Minari? No idea. So, I guess it is a good thing in that sense, that it's it's broadening the actual category, even if it is a one-year thing. Yeah, and I think it will do that. I mean, if you look at, I guess, the there's a lot more diversity um, in the categories. You know, there's often been a cry out for more women in the directing um, awards and a lot more sort of just cultural diversity in the acting categories. And there's definitely that this year. And it looks like there might be a lot in the winners based on the Golden Globes and the BAFTAs. So Nomadland looks like it's probably the front runner for the best picture. Alex, is it Mank that you've seen of the eight nominees? It's Mank. Yeah, it's Mank, which, which I think wasn't even nominated for BAFTA. No. So I don't I don't have much of a hope for that winning. I think I think what I will say about because I've saw also the Nomadland won the the BAFTA Best Picture award, and I think did it also win the Golden Globe as well? Yes. So you would expect that to be the front runner, but I think often the Oscars go a different direction from the. I feel, I feel like BAFTA usually choose the the one that everyone's saying this is going to win all the awards, and they usually go for that one. Whereas I think the Oscars, it feels like they often. They, they sometimes take a left field choice. In recent years, it does seem like that. Yeah. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't bank on Nomadland winning, even though it seems like the the clear front runner. It definitely, yeah, it definitely does seem like a clear front runner. I, I mean, I, I think it's of the, I think I've seen five of them, five of the eight. I've not seen Judas and the Black Messiah. I've not seen The Father, and I've not seen Promising Young Woman. 
I think of those that I have seen, I think Sound of Metal was probably the best, but Nomadland was very good. And it could signify Frances McDormand, I think her third Oscar, because she's won yeah. the best actress a few now. So I guess that would equal Meryl Streep at three. Yeah, so she won for, th- for three billboards. And did she win for Fargo as well? Yeah, she did win yeah, for Fargo. So... I know if she if Frances McDormand does win, yeah. that will put her one behind Catherine Hepburn, who holds the record of four. In the acting category. We yes. all know who's been nominated <laughs> for the most Oscars, and she'll come up late. <laughs> and not one. <laughs> uh, and Chloe Zhao might actually might win the Best Directing Oscar, as she won at the BAFTAs. But yeah, it's... Well, I think it will at least go down in history as being a standout for whatever reason. So let's bring our focus onto the category most fitted for our podcast, and therefore most important. Correct. It is the Oscar for Best Original Song, and it's been handed out since the seventh Oscars back in 1934. Throwing some facts at you here, guys. Mm. So this were the original, the inaugural winner was The Continental by Con Conrad. What a name. Great name. Con Conrad <laughs> from the film The Gay Divorcee. Never heard of it. Mm, not a great name. No, <laughs> yeah, yeah, basically. Normally, the nominees don't perform at the Oscars. However, that's been changing since about the 70s because of bigger names getting nominated and wanting to build the prestige of the Oscar ceremony. They've been inviting them to attend and sing. And that's kind of been how it's been going for the past sort of 50 years. But um, usually they have or want to have all the nominated songs be involved or be performed. Sometimes some things come up or for reasons someone else performs a song. Like a famous one I was watching back recently was Robin Williams performed Blame Canada because they didn't want to have Trey Parker and Matt Stone be on stage. Was that nominated? It was nominated, yeah, for, for it? Best Original Song, <laughs> yes. Um, have you not heard of the, the, sort of the amazing anecdote for Trey Parker and Matt Stone? Oh, go on. I feel like I have. There was a lot of um, sort of back and forths with the Academy about saying what they cannot do because they wanted to like basically kick up a fuss and they wanted to wear some costumes and they said no they they were given a strict dress code so both of them wore dresses and took LSD <laughs> so they cur- they they spend the entire as in their own words the entire ceremony just like freaking out <laughs> in the audience <laughs> while wearing like full ball gowns nice <laughs> yeah exactly it's a shame they didn't win <laughs> Yeah, that'd been quite the quite the acceptance speech. <laughs> yeah, I know. Tell me about it. So yeah, the song itself to be nominated has to be completely or at least mostly original. So made for the film, even if it's got heavy sampling. So you think of something like Gangsters Paradise, it wouldn't be able to be counted because it samples an older song. It has to be almost all original, and if it's a musical, it has to be an original song from or added to that musical which is why you often get films like The Lion King adding that song by Beyonce or there's a song in Les Mis <laughs> yes yeah, suddenly the from Les Mis yeah, is suddenly, the one I'm thinking yeah. of yeah. it's a good song though because you can't be nominated for a well one of the classic musical pieces So let's get on to the nominees for this year. And the first nominee we're going to go over is Husevik from the film Eurovision Song Contest, The Story of Fire Saga, which Alex, you're going to indulge us in. Yeah, so I've actually I've actually started off my note with, uh, first of all, thank you, Eurovision, The Story of the Fire Saga, for allowing us to legitimately talk about Eurovision for 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Hello, London calling. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. We've managed to shoehorn it in a few times over the uh, the year, the last year, but now we have a legitimate reason, so that's good. So have you guys seen this one? Dee, is this the film you've watched? Correct. I thought it might be. Cause it... <laughs> I knew it would be. I knew it would be. Yeah. <laughs> well, like, first of all, have you have you seen it, Ben? Yeah, well, I watched it the other day, yes. All right. So what is our general opinion of this film? It's too long. Yeah, mm-hmm. well, I also thought this. I thought it was pretty pants. <laughs> I thought the songs, like, generally were really good, and it felt like somebody yeah. had got, like, a B-side of... Not B-side, sorry. Like, an unreleased album of Eurovision songs and go, we can write a film around this, and then only wrote one joke. <laughs> and it was just about Americans being stupid. Yeah. Low-hanging fruit. That 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 joke did uh, appear several times throughout, didn't it? I mean, yeah. I, definitely the film's too long for me. 
I think there's a few funny moments, but it felt like they could have just completely taken scenes out or sections yes. of the film out, and it would have been the same film, if not better, for it. If any film ever needed to be 90 minutes, one and done, you're out, it was this one. Not over two hours. Yeah, because, uh, yeah, I mean, I think to the film's credit, I feel like it was trying to be a homage to Eurovision rather than a parody. I think I think that was one thing I would say. Like I felt like it there was a lot of love towards Eurovision in the film. Yeah. Because it, it could they could have gone so far over the top with it, but it would have felt like, well, Eurovision is already it's beyond parody because it's so <laughs> yeah, it really is, yeah. ridiculous. So I feel like that was the that was like one of the key <laughs> credits to the film. I mean, did you guys appreciate some of the, the Eurovision guest stars though? Yes. Yes, definitely. Anyone in particular? <laughs> ben. Anyone in particular? Hmm. Come on. Nobody meant you feel euphoric or anything like that? <laughs> mm, well, I'm just trying... Yeah, of course. I mean, I, I, I've, just been, I've, just, I've just been driving home from work and I've just had that in, on in the car again, just blasting out because euphoria is the greatest thing that's ever been given to men. Yeah, and Laureen makes a guest appearance as um, as they could cheat first, of course, and, and many, yep. many other winners and uh, famous notable performances. The guy with the violin. Yeah. <laughs> the guy with the violin. <laughs> the guy with the violin. I think what you say though is best like the, the the music elements and when it's it's kind of honoring Eurovision rather than just kind of making a joke of it that's when it's the best yeah and actually enjoyable yep. yeah I feel like there was a really good film in there but they never quite managed to chisel it out but let's go on to the song so the song Husevik was sung by Molly Sandon under the name My Marion and also <laughs> with a with a, a brief uh, uh, cameo from Will Ferrell of course in the in the song itself um, but the vocal um, is actually a blend of Molly Sandon and Rachel McAdams. So, oh wow, yeah. So it's it's main like if you listen to there are other versions where it's just sung by Molly Sandon, or there's like an acoustic version, which I don't know if you guys saw the video. I have for, listened to the acoustic version. Yes. <laughs> yeah, where she's like stood on like a cliff edge with a man and a keyboard. It's quite it's quite breathtaking. So you can tell that it's almost identical, but I think what they did is they they got Rachel McAdams to sing it, and they kind of blended it slightly, which I think works with the performance because I think the scene where she from it she really gives a good performance of it, even though she's not singing. I thought, but um, what do you guys think of the song though? Well, when when I don't hear Will Ferrell, I quite like it. <laughs> he's not even for very long, thankfully. <laughs> no, but it's just one of those like it just reminds me that it's kind of a film. Because otherwise, yeah, I I really I actually quite like this song. It's really catchy. For what this film is, it's quite frankly an incredible song that is too good for this film. Yeah, which is exact, exactly what I thought. While, while at the same time, I will stress, if this wins the Oscar, it's a travesty. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I won't go that far. Good. I'm complete opposite. I will once we once we talk about all the other songs, I'll tell you why. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just I think the song is genuinely beautiful. I think it, I think it, yeah. I think it's, it's moving. It's it's so moving and it's so unexpectedly moving when you when it happens. Spine tingling, goose pimply. I think those are the two best ways of describing it. But it just um yeah. I don't know, it kind of just comes out of nowhere and really grabs hold of you from from like from a film that it was like you were like drudging along with and thinking, yeah, there's a few funny not and like laughs in in like a couple of like, good good nods to you. Then all of a sudden this powerful like blasting song appears at the end of the end of the film and yeah. Deep with the word moving, I think you've captured it. So when I went to go watch this film, I knew there was going to be a song from this that was nominated for an Oscar. And I heard the first one, as in the one that goes, ho, oh, oh, ho, oh. oh, ho. Surely it can't be that one. Then I'm, I assumed it must be the Double Trouble song <laughs> that they keep singing. In, cause you, and you keep hearing like her like uh, writing this one. Yeah. And I thought, this isn't going to land. This, is not, this isn't right. It must be that Double Trouble song. And then as soon as it st- started, I was like, this is it. This is the one. Must be sort of thing. It's just, it's just great, which is, makes it all the more annoying that it's going to be looked down upon by stuck-up, out-of-touch Academy voters yeah. because it's from a comedy film. Again, I think it should be looked down upon for other reasons. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, maybe you can go on to that in a second, Ben. But I think um... Ben hates Icelandic people. <laughs> But I have I have genuinely been like mentioning this song for like a few I feel like a few months now like and I think you guys maybe thought I was joking <laughs> but, I, but deep down I was being serious that I felt it was an Oscar contender and then all of a sudden it was nominated and I was genuinely surprised but also thrilled. But go on Ben go, go say say what say piece. No, I'll what... say it. At the, I'll say it at the end of episode two. At the end of episode two because it, it'll be a summary of why. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
I okay. Mean, I mean, the, the the final thing I want to say is, is this the first ever song yes. nominated for an Oscar to feature Icelandic lyrics? <laughs> okay. uh, I assume it has to be. Ben, is that any fun facts? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, di- I'm diving deep. Bjork was nominated for Dancer in the Dark in 2003. Yes. Yeah. She's in this film, in fact. But that's the closest I can get to a fact off the top of my noggin. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was I was genuinely wondering when I said that. I was like, I wonder if there's some sort of Bjork yeah, song. the closest I can <laughs> get is Bjork. <laughs> but I bet there's never been a winner until this year. Famously, Bjork <laughs> wore a swan dress with the ice of swan's head, and she kept laying down and dropping eggs, I think. Oh, yeah, that thing. Yeah. Uh, I've got a question about the end of this song. Okay. I don't know if it's just me. What is up with the very final note where it goes almost silent? Is it actually there, or am I just getting old and can't hear it? <laughs> oh, what, like a the, like a dog whistle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, so so there, there is obviously the Spiorg note, I think it's called. Uh, yeah. And she, but it does fade out. I I, I don't think it is there. I think it it kind of right. it feels okay. like Ooh. it's about to appear like like on the end, but I, I don't think it does. I think it is just. I think it's a fade out. Yeah, I was worried it was one of those like TikTok things where it's yeah. only people under twenty five can hear this. <laughs> well, I mean, yes. I, I mean, I, I mean, I'm assuming you're referencing all of the note. Like, it does, it is there. At one oh, yeah, it's at the very end. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Alex, for that comprehensive view of Eurovision. I guess. <laughs> Play a ya ya ding dong. <laughs> Why wasn't that nominated? It should have been like one of those years where two were nominated, you know, like um, Slumdog Millionaire. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I want Johnny John's Johnny John John's song as well. <laughs> Carry on, Ben. Sorry. Gosh, this is what this is what you call a tonal shift, though. Now, bloody hell! Right, the next song nominated is the song "Fight for You" from the film Judas and the Black Messiah. So, this song is written by Demille and Her, which is spell H. Dot e dot r. Respect the periods. Respect, yes, yeah, <laughs> basically. Uh, with lyrics by her and Tiara Thomas, who are frequent collaborators. Now, unfortunately, Judas and the Black Messiah is not widely available at the time of recording here in the UK. So none of us have seen it, or at least legally. And that's the reason why. <laughs> yeah, probably. But yes, for those unaware, which is probably both... <laughs> all of us yeah. uh, Judas and the Black Messiah directed by Shaka King is a semi-autobiographical retelling of the FBI informant Bill O'Neill as he goes undercover in the Illinois chapter of the Black Panther Party and the song apparently features at the end credits of this film so before I go into some facts and a bit of the background in this song you've at least listened to it because you are kind enough gentlemen to do me that favour <laughs> uh, what do you think of this song? Yeah, so obviously I've not seen it because it's not available in the UK. But this actual song, I, I did quite like it. It sort of sounds like, to me, well, to me, it sounds like an ode to every R&B song of the late 90s slash early noughties. Yes. It even has that sort of, uh, like, the violin bit that's in loads of songs back then. Mm-hmm. I did try to think of other songs it was in, but the only one that came to mind was Millennium by Robbie Williams. <laughs> so it doesn't quite fit my every R&B song <laughs> thing. <laughs> Definitely doesn't, now. It's like you made a really sensible point, and then it's gone. Yeah. And Robbie Williams, the, the the violin, and that is a sample from um, "You Only Live Twice," isn't it? Oh yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we wow. think we discussed it in the in the in the sixties Bond episode. What I will say about this song, though, is I was surprised when I listened to it that it was nominated because I did not find it that remarkable. Uh, it's a good song, but I'd, compared to what I would think of a best original song, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. it's to me it seems like a seven out of ten. Good. Not great. I'd say if you go back and look at the history of songs that are nominated for Best Original Song, they're not all bangers. True. Well, to be fair, they must be decent because our Lady Diane Warren has not <laughs> ever won. <laughs> um, Alex, what do you think? I liked it. Where D said he sort of it reminded him of R&B from the 90s and early noise. It really reminded me of like 70s soul. Like, I don't know if you guys know Curtis Mayfield or like, yes, um, yeah. like some Marvin Gaye songs. It was kind of like that, which I think is probably the like the sort of the vibe she was going for with the performance, because I guess that's kind of around the time the film is set, maybe? Yes. The 70s. I actually thought it was a bit too cool for the Oscars. <laughs> <laughs> it had a very like, I don't know if Off the Wall is right, but like when, when it comes to some of the other songs, they, they really sound like they're Oscar songs, like they're trying to be an Oscar song. I felt like this one just wasn't even playing up to that. It was just its own thing. It was like it was written to go along with this film. They weren't even considering the fact that it might be tagged along as like an Oscar contender. It was just mm. like, yeah, this is just like a cool little song to put on the end because it fits the vibe of the film. Not that I've seen it, but I feel like 
I can get the sense of the film from the from the song almost. I put music on scene instead of Mize on scene. <laughs> Might have coined a phrase. Are you yeah. just coined a phrase? <laughs> oh, that's what the podcast should have been called. <laughs> music on scene. <laughs> music on scene. To be fair, that, I think we're not cool enough. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> we can never, we can never, never live up to that. that. That song from a movie definitely fits our aesthetic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That song from just very on the nose. <laughs> very obvious. Yeah, I'm basically an amalgam of your guy's opinion is what mine is. I think it both it seems to combine that sort of 90s r&b aesthetic and the sort of motown early uh, late 60s early 70s sound because i think a large part of it and if you've watched the video she's it's making that connection from the past and now and the sort of difficulties that i guess the film is probably trying to bring up all these difficulties problems with race and all the violence going on in especially in the states at the moment it's making that connection and i think she does that musically as well by like alex said a style that is very of the time when the film is set in the 70s and combining it with now a bit like what d said the late 90s r&b maybe not robin williams um <laughs> yeah maybe, maybe not robbie yeah, yeah probably not but yeah, I mean, have you ever, have you heard of her? It seems weird when I keep saying "have you heard of her," but that is a name. I know, yeah, yeah, nope. Uh, no, I haven't actually. I, I've, I've recognised seeing the name written down the way it's written yeah. down, if that makes sense. But I, I, I've never listened to her music. Before. Yeah, her music. I mean, we, none of us fall within the Radio One demographic anymore, so that might be why. But also, her real name's Gabriella Samiento Wilson, and it seems like That's she's great fairly name. low on the radar. It is, isn't it? Gabriella Samiento Wilson. I'm not even doing it sort of justice, I think, saying it. But she's making like huge waves in the States in various different fields. Like, she opened this year's Super Bowl. She's been nominated for over a dozen Grammys. Again, make of that what you will. It is the Grammys. <laughs> she's won, she won R&B Album of the Year. And she also, this year, won Song of the Year, which I think is the biggest award at the Grammys. Who knows? It sounds important, doesn't it? Song of the Year. It does sound a big deal, yeah. <laughs> but the song has also been a huge deal because it came in the wake of the George Floyd murders and the Black Lives Matter movement over the past year and it's been quite influential, especially over in the States. Nice. And it's kind of got like, I think about maybe about two thirds way through the song, it's got like almost like a slam poetry, quite in your face, confrontational element to it, which again, I think that's what her, not message or mantra, but she she makes songs that have like a social importance or social connection. And I think that's what she's trying to do in this song as well like if you watch the video for fight for you there's like an intro sort of dialogue which i think again is trying to it's that very sort of reaching out to sort of the young audience trying to motivate people to kind of share their voice to kind of come together to kind of fight discrimination and from interviews that i've read around this song she really wants to sort of charge that which Again, I think that's part of why I don't think Husevik should win, <laughs> because I think all the songs that we're coming on to have this kind of message, and I think that's quite important at the moment. And if Husevik wins, <laughs> I think that might come across quite badly. Not saying that it's a bad song, but th I think the other nominees are more than songs, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think I feel like you, you've definitely done a good job of selling. Oh, thank you. <laughs> selling it over. It's very rare that I do do that. <laughs> I mean, I still think he's a bit should win, but you tried your best. Yeah, it's best original song. <laughs> yeah, you tried your best. So yeah, I think, and like it's another thing, I think this is probably my favourite song of all of them. Again, I think it's too cool for the Oscars. It'd be weird if this wins. And looking at the odds, it's quite near the bottom. But I really like this. It's the only one I feel like it, I could listen to, it and it's not on some sort of like movie music playlist it feels like it's just some r&b really cool hip that is clearly not me and i'm still trying to fit in with the kids kind of music <laughs> using the word hip yeah well yeah you know i'm 30 <laughs> years old i'm out of it alex <laughs> i mean that is yeah that is kind of what i was touching on as well if like when i was saying like it wasn't pandering to an oscar audience it doesn't feel like it's that kind of song and like in a way that's why it should win it's the most like probably the song that you could just like listen to casually so yeah yeah You've, you've, you've partially convinced me then. <laughs> partially is the most I've ever got from you, Alex, in probably about 26 years. And it's all you will ever get. Yeah. Well, you know, I'll take it. See what I'll do in the next 26 years. <laughs> okay, so that brings an end to part one of our look at the Oscars. When this comes out, you'll be able to listen to this, watch the Oscars, and then come back for part two. You're going to enjoy it, I'm sure. It's always a great show, isn't it, Ben? What, the Oscars? Yeah, the Oscars. No, it's terrible. No, the, I thought you meant this show. This show's fantastic, but the Oscars is shocking. And they both run on for too long. <laughs> <laughs> True. We'll see you next week. Bye. Bye.
Alex, say bye. Now, normally, the performers of the song, so the performers of the nom, sorry, say that again. Now, normally, the performers of the nominees perform the. I'm going. I'm, go- I'm tripping over <laughs> my words here. This is the right tongue twister. Okay, originally, the performers of the song did not perform the uh, song. God, I can't get it out. It's like a tongue twister. <laughs> <laughs>